Good morning. How are you? My name is Steve Hughes. I work with uh, Ortho Virginia as a uh, spine surgeon and uh, cover primarily the um, Alexandria, Arlington, and uh, Fairfax regions. I've been with Ortho Virginia now for 15 years and have found it to be really an excellent practice growing by leaps and bounds and the practice itself uh, of spine, which is that's what I do primarily, has been very rewarding here because the volume of patients that come through is just enormous. Um, most of the people uh, that I see are people that are not coming to see a spine surgeon, they're coming to see a spine specialist. And I think that's an important distinction for everyone to understand that uh, if you're seeing a physician that does surgery, uh, most of the patients that they're actually going to be seeing are people that they recommend alternative therapies for because spine surgery, while it's safe, it's excellent, and it really has got great outcomes, um, the percentage of people that need surgery for their neck or their back is really very, very low, um, less than 5%, frankly, even in my population. And if you get referred to a spine surgeon, I think that's one of the very first things you should try to check up on about them is number one, are they trained in a fellowship that uh, is a, a uh, training ground just for spinal disorders, or is it just a surgical subspecialty training? Because most of, most of the patients that we see are not going to require surgery. They're going to be people that could benefit from additional physical therapy, from bracing, from injections, medications, and in the vast majority of cases, just some education about what exactly they are, uh, you know, they're experiencing as pain, that it's self-limited, um, that it's not going to cause them, you know, any kind of ongoing disability. So let me take you for a, a brief walk through, through one of my clinic days. I'll see patients that present with MRIs referred typically from um, family practitioners, uh, internists, and the MRIs will have you know, some very disturbing findings on them. They'll say there's herniated discs, there's bone spurs, there's a spinal stenosis, which is a narrowing of the spinal canal. The patients have had a, a week or two or sometimes a month or so of pain, and they're very concerned that the symptoms are going to be lifelong or that they're going to be disabling. Uh, indeed, some of them are concerned that numbness is a big deal. And so most of the, the visit is involved in a brief physical exam, then showing the patient what the MRI looks like, explaining what the words that the radiologist has written down are, that what, what herniated disc means, and that's simply a, a small piece of tissue that's um, extruded or moved out of its container and is up against a nerve and that the body most of the time will uh, simply resolve that uh, through motion and exercise. Uh, natural processes will make the disc herniation shrink up. They see words like uh, bone spurs or spondylosis and uh, tell them that those are normal signs of aging like wrinkles, gray hair. They typically are very well tolerated by the body. So that's what most of my clinic is, is just reassuring people that these findings are not very significant, um, that they're not gonna be long lasting, and that uh, very simple measures such as exercise, uh, for example, is probably the most common thing I prescribe for them, uh, that, those, that that measure will get rid of it. How exercise works uh, so good for us uh, is that the it increases blood flow. Blood flow, uh, you know, moves nerves around. It starts to shrink up discs. It uh, repositions bone spurs in the spine, such that uh, people's pain can be pretty dramatically improved with a simple exercise plan that can last no more than two or three weeks. So most of my time is spent uh, explaining. Uh, how that can be helpful to people. Secondarily, there's a lot of misconceptions about um, injection therapies, you know, that they're just uh, temporizing measures. And while Ortho Virginia is about to start a pain service um, that does do a lot of injections, uh, the injections 
are helpful in just getting people over the hump in the sense that the acute inflammation of a trapped nerve can be just terribly painful. And by simply, if the movement alone through physical therapy doesn't uh, get the nerve untrapped and, and make them feel more comfortable, an injection of some steroid medicine around the area can be helpful uh, by shrinking nerve tissue, shrinking inflammatory tissue, and allowing the parts of the spine to start to move in, in synchrony again. I get a lot of questions about, uh, you know, what are the appropriate medications for this? As you know, the U.S. has just faced a major opioid crisis, and uh, spine issues were one of the biggest aspects of that. Um, the prescribing of narcotics has really dramatically diminished over the last five years. And, and it's very good because people, the pain is so bad that people think, well, you know, I, I feel like I probably need some narcotics. But when you combine um, th simple physical therapy with some over-the-counter medications and maybe some mild muscle relaxers, uh, and you educate and reassure people, because remember, most of the time, the people that are coming into the clinic are very frightened of, of the degree of pain or the numbness that they're feeling. And so all it really takes is some simple reassurance and these mild medications, and they can you know, really be on their way to, to uh, resuming normal life patterns very quickly. So the last aspect, and I spend, uh, really it's only two or three patients a clinic out of a clinic of you know, 30 some patients or more, um, just a couple of them will get offered surgery. And these are people that have consistently failed uh, physical therapy. The medications are simply not making them better. Um, they've had injection therapies uh, to no avail. Um, then we start to talk about surgery. And in basically every case, I tell someone, I think you're a surgical candidate. I also tell them, you make sure that after we get done with the discussion that you have a second opinion. And if they feel like they don't know uh, you know how to find a second opinion. Uh, I'll provide you know other people in the area, but it's a, just a really critical thing because uh, surgery is a serious prospect. And while it works wonderfully, and uh, just to uh, have done thousands of these surgeries and have many many patients that are just very grateful for them, they are a serious undertaking, and they should be approached with the recognition that when you have complications with them, they are profound and can be life altering. So second opinions allow the another doctor uh, to look over the same information, look at the plans that you've been through with your surgeon, that is how much therapy has been done, has there been bracing trials, have there been injection treatments and medication, how long has it gone on, what kind of neurologic issues are you exactly having, and then uh, let them explain to you, number one, do you need surgery? Number two, uh, is the surgical plan uh, that's being prescribed appropriate? And then uh, lastly, what to expect from the recovery? If the two opinions don't jive or don't, don't match up, then a, third, then a third opinion is appropriate. Most of the time, uh, they're going to jive, particularly in my practice, because I really do wait uh, uh, until an appropriate time for surgery. After the opinion is done, then you'd come back and talk. They typically come back and talk to me. We go over further what the recovery is like. In most cases, the recovery is not months. Um, it's a matter of days or weeks. And the uh, resumption of uh, regular activities is very quick. We have an excellent uh, physical therapy network here at uh, Ortho Virginia with some just wonderful doctors that take care of our patients postoperatively. And uh, the whole goal is to get back to golf, to exercise, to run, to all the normal things that make uh, a life full and to do it uh, quickly after surgery. Um, in my practice, most people after disc herniations are exercising fully within a couple of weeks. Uh, with fusion surgeries, they're golfing within six to eight weeks. So um, I think that when surgery is ultimately chosen, I think people can have a lot of confidence in the fact that the procedure is going to be quick, you know, the hospitalization is going to be fast, and that they're going to be uh, resuming a normal life. Uh, absent the pain that drove them to surgery uh, very quickly. So 
it's really been a very gratifying practice here and uh, I'm very happy with Ortho Virginia. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Hughes. And we have a couple questions coming in now. One is, any procedures recommend, um, excuse me, are there any procedures recommended for spinal fractures related to osteoporosis, perhaps for keloplasty or kyphoplasty? Yes, two great procedures that were uh, started about 12 to 15 years ago. Uh, in one case, uh, a small trocar, which is a big, which is a needle, is inserted into the bone and a balloon is inflated and the fracture is opened up and then a, a cement is put into that void. In the other case, the, the needle is just basically placed into the bone and the bone is filled with cement. Uh, they both are very powerful ways to get people uh, out of pain and back active and out of a brace quickly. Uh, in most cases, though, it should really be done only after the body's been allowed with bracing to uh, try to heal for at least a couple of months. Uh, in other words, uh, the minute you have a fracture, uh, standard bracing protocols and standard therapy protocols should be used for at least a couple of months prior to considering it. Although it's a small surgery, it is still a surgery and therefore they can have complications. Okay, thank you. The next question is, I have, it looks like it's in regards to spinal stenosis. I have done physical therapy, had two steroid injections and several rounds of oral steroids with little improvement in pain and weakness in my right leg. Are there other options available to fix spinal stenosis? Yes, there's a couple of uh, options that are available depending upon your age and overall physical health. Uh, in general, though, spinal stenosis is very simply treated surgically with, uh, it's called a decompression, a removal of bony tissue that's pinching the nerves. Uh, in the majority of cases with spinal stenosis, uh, fusion surgery is not needed. That's one of the most critical things to talk to your surgeon about if you're recommended to have surgery, uh, do I need a fusion? Um, the answer the majority of times is no, that a simple decompression or laminectomy is gonna be more than sufficient and uh, will get you back uh, to normal activities quickly. Okay, thank you. People are saying they're not hearing my question, so will you repeat the question? Yeah, the question, the okay. question. I think going forward, sorry. Okay, okay. okay. How many injections should you have before thinking about surgery? This is really important. There has been a rash uh, that's been noticed among some of the surgeons in the community recently of um, infections. Um, infections are rare uh, after injections, uh, but too many injections can definitely have an impact on your uh, chances of getting an infection. So what I tell people uh, is that if you don't achieve at least 50% improvement with one or two injections, that uh, three is probably the maximum you should be getting. Um, and if there's the minute that you get over 50% relief, you should hold on the injections and just do go back to the rehab and mild medications uh, to get better. There is real danger in getting too many injections. Okay, thank you. The next question is, I am 72 and had a bad fall in December with broken bones. My MRI shows two compressed disc fractures in my neck and two bulging discs and herniated discs. I'm doing physical therapy two days a week and it seems to be helping some. Do the herniated discs ever get better? The question is, do herniated discs ever improve themselves? And the answer is yes. Um, 85 to 90% of the time, if we do an MRI and see a herniated disc, uh, and just give it some time, the body can melt these discs away uh, through an enzymatic process uh, that the body uh, will actually shrink up or deteriorate the herniated disc. And it's in pretty remarkable in the sense that you can have an MRI and then repeat that MRI a year uh, plus later, and that disc will be completely, completely gone. So. That's why just because you have a disc herniation doesn't mean you automatically need surgery. They do get resorbed by the body. Okay, thank you. The next question is, I had pins and needles in my feet and legs for over two years. Was finally diagnosed at mild narrowing of the lumbar with pinching nerves. I've tried PT. 
Does it seem like this is still possible? Is there a possibility it will be resolved on its own? Well, the, I think the key uh, thing that you mentioned in there is that you have mild narrowing. Typically, mild narrowing is not going to cause a lot of tingling in your legs. My hope is that uh, you've also been referred for consultation with a neurologist that can talk to you about a condition called neuropathy, which is uh, kind of on the upswing with COVID and uh, um, you know over the last couple of years. But neuropathy can uh, cause tingling and in the face of uh, simply mild narrowing. Okay, thank you. The next question is, I fractured uh, T1 in a fall in late January of this year. I've done seven plus months of physical therapy and two months of wearing a brace, and the fracture has not closed. Pain is clearly less severe, but it still exists. Do you have any recommendations? Yeah, typically what's going to happen is at this point, you're going to get your imaging studies repeated, and if the fracture still is acute, there'll be what's called edema or water fluid uh, around the fracture still. And then you would definitely be a candidate to be uh, consulted on about a vertebroplasty or a kyphoplasty. Okay, thank you. In regards to the MRIs, another person has said, why does it seem I need so many MRIs? Difficult to say. One good thing about having uh, multiple MRIs that many people are afraid of is that uh, that they have radiation and they don't. I mean, you definitely can uh, have as many of those as you can tolerate. Um, they are somewhat claustrophobic, but they certainly are not endangering your health through uh, radiation because they use simple magnetic waves. Um, typically, MRIs are very good at looking at the soft tissues uh, around your spine and your nerve roots and the discs, et cetera. And so uh, MRIs sometimes will be fairly frequently done if the diagnosis is in question or um, if they're looking at different parts of the spine, trying to figure out why uh, you're having your particular symptoms. I wouldn't be afraid of having too many MRIs, but I definitely would be asking questions about why am I having so many MRIs from the people that are ordering them. Okay, thank you. Can kyphosis, I hope I'm saying that correctly, can kyphosis be treated by a posture brace? Kyphosis, the symptoms from kyphosis can be treated, but typically kyphosis, which is a, which is a bending forward of the spine, uh, and you said it perfectly, by the way, um, it causes symptoms of, because as the spine kind of buckles forward like, like this, the muscles in the back spasm a lot, and it causes a lot of back pain in that way. Bracing can by, it doesn't prevent the, the curving forward, but it does relax the muscles. So bracing can be very valuable uh, for certain forms of kyphosis. Okay, thank you. What is your recommendation for a synovial cyst that is compressing the spine and the L4 and L5 nerve roots? Very good question. Uh, they, and, and uh, shows that they know their back well, that they're asking a question like that. Uh, there are small joints right behind the disc uh, of the spine, and as they slide over each other, they have cartilage on them, just like a hip or a knee. They can The cartilage can wear out. The bone on bone can create a fluid cyst that can pinch a nerve. They are extremely painful. And if, uh, again, if the exercise regimen, if mild medications, and if an injection or two does not improve things, a simple decompression uh, typically can improve things quite a bit. There is a role for fusion in those patients, but it's an indiv it's a individual by individual sort of a evaluation. Uh, but the synovial cysts are very painful and uh, very difficult to get rid of. Okay, thank you. The next question is, do you have any thoughts on spondylolisthesis? I have stage two along with stenosis and I'm trying to avoid surgery if possible. And my answer to you would be you very likely can. Spondylolisthesis, um, which is a slippage of one vertebrae on the other, does cause stenosis by, as the, as the spinal canal narrows, it can pinch a nerve and be very painful. However, listen to this, 40 plus million people in the United States have this and uh, do just fine. Professional athletes, dancers, ballet people, et cetera, they, they uh, have got this condition and they can perform at a very high athletic level. 
So the diagnosis, uh, while it certainly can be a painful condition that leads to surgery, actually of that 40 plus million people, it's, it's pretty rare to have surgery because again, exercise, understanding what the diagnosis is and realizing that you can have a very normal full life, uh, athletic life, uh, even with the condition is, uh, is really possible. Okay, thank you. I have, the, excuse me, the next question is, I've had burning on my right upper back, right arm and leg for 11 years. I've been recommended for surgery because the thought is my bulging discs are laying on nerves. Does this sound right to you? Uh, typically, one of the consultants that I find most helpful for uh, pain uh, that's difficult to diagnose is a rheumatologist. We uh, have some excellent rheumatologists in this community. Um, I happen to use a Dr. Fong Nguyen uh, frequently, that group, um, but they are just excellent at diagnosing some of these uh, more difficult to discern types of uh, burning uh, uh, rheumatic type of uh, pains. So before you have surgery, I would definitely have a rheumatologist to consult, and I definitely would get, as we talked about earlier, a second or third opinion. Okay, thank you. The next question is, I have constant severe chronic L5-S1 pain, have had a microdiscectomy and laminectomy over a year ago, and injections have not helped. When is it time to consider a disc fusion? Typically, assuming that you have uh, further studies after the original surgery, um, and those studies don't show it, like another disc herniation, for example, um, I typically tell people to try a decompression twice before having any kind of a fusion. Um, of course, there, there is a lot of qualifiers in that answer in the sense that, you know, I don't know what your images look like, but usually uh, the typical recommendations, just as a, as a generality, is, is two decompressions prior to a fusion. Okay, thank you. Next question is, are platelet injections effective? I've heard yes and no. Platelet injections or, uh, you know, uh, PRP type regenerative uh, therapies are, I know of them. I do not personally practice them. Uh, they're, they are, can be fairly expensive. Uh, we've got a very good uh, unit, very ethical unit here at Ortho Virginia that does them. And I know there's some proven value for shoulder, knee, and hip uh, injections. The jury's out, to my understanding, as far as uh, platelet injections for the spine. And in general, if someone's recommending that, I would uh, definitely get a second opinion for that. Okay, thank you. The next question, and this is a little bit lengthy, is I have moderate spinal, spinal stenosis and spondylolisthesis. My legs and feet go numb after a few minutes of standing or walking. It has been recommended that I have a lumbar laminectomy and fusion. I am about 80 pounds overweight and was told that the weight loss would not affect the leg, feet, and numbness. Do you feel that is correct? In general, that's very true. Um, what the issue is with weight typically uh, in, in the practice of spinal surgery is that the heavier you are, the more likely it is to have complications from surgery, infections, blood clots, um, you know, other problems, bone fractures, etc. cetera. Um, so just losing the weight is not gonna change the anatomy of the situation. Uh, it certainly makes you a better surgical candidate. It makes it more likely that some conservative measures are gonna help you. Um, but to say, you know, that if I lose 80 pounds, my problem will go away is, uh, uh, I would think that I, I would have trouble with that. Okay, thank you. The next question is, I am a weightlifter and big at the gym, but have been told I need a discectomy in my lumbar spine. Is that something that will prevent me from ever lifting weights again? In my opinion and in my practice, it would not. Now, of course, there's a lot of qualifiers with this um, relative to the age, relative to what type of disc herniation it is, but it is absolutely possible to achieve a very full, active, uh, basically normal athletic life uh, after a microdiscectomy. Okay, thank you. Do you have any opinions on chiropractic decompression? 
I really love chiropractic decompression uh, the, the, from what I know of it uh, because it involves traction therapies. Now, traction therapies work especially good for the neck, but they do work for the low back as well. The only issue that I would have is, and again, I'm not a trained chiropractic. I know very little about the, the actual uh, practice of chiropractic, but I have seen the decompression tables, is that it's just like with physical therapy, that if you don't achieve results uh, you know, within a fairly short period of time, three to four weeks, uh, that certainly that's something that's not likely going to help. And if you do achieve results, you don't have to keep doing it. You could go back to a regular exercise and stretching program, and that should have the same effects as the, the traction tables have. Okay, great. Could you explain what is involved in a disc decompression? By that, I'm going to assume it's a, a, disc, a microdiscectomy. What happens is the two, two sides of the spine are bone, and then there's a jelly-like disc in between. The jelly-like disc can um, harden into small clumps, and that, those clumps of disc can actually come out of the disc container and pinch nerves on the, on the outside. The decompression of the disc is the, a small opening is made in the disc uh, with a, a micro knife or a a small uh, little uh, pituitary type of a rondeur. You go into the disc and pull these loose fragments out. That decompresses the disc. There, in the uh, older days, uh, there was uh, intradiscal electrotherapies where catheters were inserted into the disc to heat up the disc. Um, by and large, those treatments have fallen by the wayside because although they were quote unquote disc decompression, uh, there was never the kind of outcomes that, uh, you know, that were appropriate. Okay, thank you. The next question is, I have a bulging disc and have tried a lot. Stem cells, solar therapy, physical therapy, and exercise every day. I own a horse farm and I'm pretty active. My pain is mostly on the left side and bothers me most sleeping and standing. Is this something that surgery would help with? I don't have pain in the disc. The uh, question is really too complex to be answered, uh, you know, reasonably. The, there's just too many unknown parts. One of the great things about, uh, you know, any surgeon that you consult with is that they've got a lot of evidence to sift through. They've got not only your story, your past medical history, but again, a brief physical exam and the imaging studies. Together with all those factors, I think if you get a couple of uh, a couple of opinions and they're all pointing toward the same treatment, that, that that's your answer. Okay, thank you. And I hope I pronounced this correctly. Can you touch on foraminal narrowing, and would that cause a problem when I'm having from the waist to the knee? Yes, the foramen are a small part of the spine. Uh, there's there's the central canal, and then on, along the side, there are small holes that go out, which, are, which contain individual nerve roots themselves. These individual nerve roots go to, say, the back of your buttock, the front of your thigh, the tip of your toe. So foraminal stenosis occurs as the spine collapses, uh, as it ages, it starts to just gradually start to collapse and, and rotate, and you can get foraminal stenosis but that's going to be of a single nerve root, not of multiple nerve roots. So I doubt that's the cause of your symptoms from the waist down. Uh, they are more likely along a single nerve root. Like in other words, if you had single thigh pain or single foot or leg pain or buttock discomfort or shoulder pain, that's foraminal stenosis. Um, what you're describing is more like a central type main stenosis. Okay, thank you. What type of time off would you suggest for most spinal surgeries? And are you always restricted from driving? You're restricted from driving during the time period when you're taking narcotics. After you're taking narcotics, which can be as short as a day or two for a simple discectomy to three to four weeks with more complex fusion surgeries, then it's of course, you know, safe to drive, assuming, you know, physically you're you're feeling up to it. The Typical driving restrictions uh, after recovery after these surgeries, again, can range from a few days for a, for a microdiscectomy um, 
up to, in, in my practice anyway, about four to six weeks. Okay, thank you. I have spinal stenosis, and do you have any pain meds that you recommend? Yes, uh, pain medication for spinal stenosis, assuming that exercise alone is not controlling it, is going to revolve around uh, typically a simple Tylenol arthritis, assuming no liver issues, or um, mild uh, Advil, Aleve type anti-inflammatories, you know, assuming you don't have any significant, uh, you know, intestinal issues. Okay, looks like we have a couple more. One of the last ones is, do having, is having a herniated disc always lead to surgery? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, if you take all comers with, with uh, new disc herniations, 90% of them are going to get better on their own, uh, typically within a couple of months. Very good. And it looks like our last question is, do you know of the procedure called intercept procedure and what are your thoughts on it? I don't know of intercept. Okay, that was sure enough. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Hughes. Any questions that we might not have gotten to, we will circle back uh, and answer them at a later date. Thank you for letting me participate.